In the last video, we introduced some basic concepts about IA32 assembly. We talked a little bit about the registers that are available in IA32 and about a few of the instructions for moving data around. In this video, I want to talk about a few other common instructions in IA32 assembly and how those instructions work. And we'll do that using our IA32 cheat sheet as a guide. The cheat sheet organizes the assembly instructions we're most likely to encounter into a few broad categories, including arithmetic and logic operations that we know are performed by the ALU. And just like in your homework for CPU, we need some operations for moving data between different registers and back and forth between registers and memory. And finally, we have a number of instructions for control flow within a program, including branches and loops, as well as function calls. Let's start with some of the basic arithmetic and logic operations. To illustrate what's going on here, let's draw ourselves a register file and an ALU. If we're given an addL instruction, then we're adding to 32-bit numbers, and in this case, those numbers come from the EAX and EBX registers. And if we look up the add instruction on our cheat sheet, we see that it's getting data from locations called source and destination, and it's adding those two values and then putting the result back into the destination. And so in this case, that means that we are sending data from the EAX and EBX registers into the ALU, and then the sum that comes out of the ALU is getting stored back into the EBX register, and so we are overwriting this with the result of the addition. The subtraction and multiplication operations are defined similarly. And note that all of these arithmetic and logic operations are overwriting a destination register, which is also one of the inputs to that operation. In the case of left and right shifts, note that we have separate assembly instructions for performing an arithmetic right shift versus a logical right shift. So if we wanted to do a right shift on the value in the EDX register, since that's a signed value, we should be using an arithmetic right shift. And in this case, if we want to shift right by one bit, we can give the literal one as the source input for the shift right operation. And then the result gets stored back in the EDX register. It's worth talking for a moment about where the heck the names of these assembly instructions come from. In the case of this arithmetic right shift operator, the S is for shift, A is for arithmetic, R is for right. So this is an arithmetic right shift, and the L means that we are operating on 32-bit numbers. Over here we have the instruction suffixes for IA32. So if you see an instruction that ends with L, that's operating on 32-bit numbers. Instructions ending in W are 16-bit operations, and B indicates an 8-bit operation. We won't see B or W very often, but you might sometimes encounter instructions ending in Q, which are 64-bit operations, but we shouldn't end up with any 64-bit instructions when we compile to 32-bit assembly. As was the case in our homework for CPU, some of the instructions only take a single operand. So if we performed a NOT instruction and gave it ECX as its input, then we would be sending the value from the ECX register into the ALU, which would then perform bitwise negation and send the result, which would be all ones, back to the ECX register. And so we would overwrite this with minus one. 
We also started to look in the last video at operations that move data around, including between different registers and back and forth between registers and RAM. As we saw in that last video, we have a stack pointer register and a base pointer register that each store a memory address and those addresses refer respectively to the bottom of the current stack frame and the top of the current stack frame. And so when we are transferring data back and forth between registers and memory, much of the time the places in memory that we are accessing will be near the stack pointer and base pointer registers. The most common way that we will transfer data between locations is with a move operation. In this case, we are moving data from the EBX register to the ECX register, which means that the value 8 gets copied and overwrites the value in ECX. If we want to send data to main memory, then we can also use a move operation, but we have to specify that the destination is a memory address, which we do using parentheses around the register that's holding the address. In this case, parentheses EBP means that we are treating the 32-bit value in the EBP register as a memory address. And since this is the destination of the move operation, that means that the place we are sending the data is the location in memory specified by this address. And so we will overwrite this value in RAM with the data that we got from the EAX register. We can also bring data from memory into the registers by having the source of the move instruction be a memory address specified with parentheses. So in this case, the parentheses as part of the source indicate that we are fetching data from memory, and that is based on the address that is stored in the stack pointer register, but we are also specifying an offset from that address. The address in the ESP register is FFFFD448, and we are adding to that the hex value 1,4. So when we have a number before the parentheses, we add that to the value in the register to find the memory address that we are actually going to be loading data from. And in this case, the address we calculated is exactly the same as the address from the base pointer register. And so we're actually loading the value 5 into the EDX register. These various ways of referring to different addresses in memory in our IA32 assembly code are summarized in the addressing modes portion of the IA32 cheat sheet. Normal mode is when we are loading data where the address is given by a register in parentheses, and displacement mode is where we are adding some value to the address in the register before we then fetch the data from memory or send the data to the memory. Note that there's also a more advanced indexing mode that you might see if you compile real C code, but is not going to show up in our IA32 examples. Of note, move operations aren't the only way that we can load data from or store data to memory. We can have other operations like subtraction or multiplication where one of the operands is a thing that we are loading from memory. However, in IA32, we are allowed to have at most one of the operands to any given instruction come from memory. 
And so this second instruction is illegal because we can't have both of the inputs being fetched from memory. Other instructions for transferring data include push and pop, which we will see frequently in our exercises, and some others that you might see in code produced by a compiler, but that we won't be talking about much in our activities. As our final topic for this video, let's think a bit about control flow in assembly, and we'll think for now about compare and jump operations, because function calls in assembly are complicated enough to merit their own video. To think about control flow, we need a program with multiple instructions, so let's go back to our sequence of arithmetic and logic instructions from before. All of the different jump operations on our cheat sheet refer to a label. So that means we need to add a label to our assembly code that will be a destination we can jump to. In IA32, a label is just some name followed by a colon, and then we can use that name as the label in a jump operation. So for example, we could add an unconditional jump operation where we are jumping to the destination label that we just added, but we've now created for ourselves an infinite loop. Our program will execute the add instruction and then the right shift instruction, and then the not instruction, and then it will jump back to the add instruction, execute that, and then the shift, and then the not, and jump back. So this unconditional backwards jump is probably a bad idea, and instead we want a conditional jump where we are only jumping if a certain condition is met. All of the other jump operations are conditional jumps, but those conditional jumps decide whether to jump or not based on the value in the flags register. As we know, the flags like zero and overflow flags are being set by arithmetic operations all the time. But the way these conditional jump operations work is that their semantics, like jump if equal or jump if less than, make sense if the preceding operation that set the values in the flag register was the compare instruction. So if, for example, we wanted to jump backwards as long as the value in the ECX register is not equal to zero, we could first do a compare operation where we are comparing zero with ECX, and then we could use a jump not equal. Like any conditional jump, the jump not equal will check the flags that were set by the most recent operation, and the most recent operation was a compare, which uses the ALU to do subtraction, but doesn't store the result of the subtraction, it just does it to produce some flags. And so in this case, the zero flag would be set if these are equal, and so jump not equal is testing whether the zero flag is set. If it's not set, then these two things must not have been equal, and so we'll jump to the instruction following the label. If, on the other hand, the zero flag is set, then that means that these two things were equal, and so rather than jumping, we will continue on to the next instruction in our assembly program. And so if we were moving along executing an assembly program, and we got to these instructions, well, this not instruction would flip the value of all of the bits in the ECX register. And so the first time we get to the compare and jump, it would not be equal to zero because that value was negative one. And so we would jump back to here and we would add again and shift again and negate again. Now that all ones value would become all zeros. And so now we would compare and these are equal, so we would not do our jump. And so 
after these instructions, we would just continue on to whatever assembly instructions were after this jump in the program. The other conditional jump instructions operate similarly, where their names make sense if the jump operation is immediately following a compare operation. But note that when we do compare a, b, and then jump less than or equal, we are jumping if b is less than or equal to a. The test instruction also sets flags for the purpose of setting up conditional jumps, but reasoning about how test and then jump will behave is trickier because all of the conditional jump operations are named with the assumption that you are doing compare and then jump. So we'll focus on compare and jump in our activities. In class, we'll get more practice analyzing short snippets of assembly code. Then next time, we'll dive in deeper with analyzing whole functions in assembly. And then on your next homework, you will get a chance to write assembly functions of your own.